first landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. The rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the stopper. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO classified. UFO classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Happy Fantopia Friday. This is Erica Lukes. I was happy to be here. And I must say, today has been one of those busy days. I had the pleasure of talking to Stanton Friedman about some things. And I also spent a couple hours on the phone with my friend Peter Robbins. His father passed away three weeks ago, and that has been very difficult for him. I think the world of Peter, he is going to be on my show, as is Stan, coming up pretty quickly, and I look forward to that. So it's never a dull moment in a day in the life. I've also started my book, which my guest this evening has been trying to get me to do for quite some time, and will have to hold my hand through the whole process. But that's the way it rolls. I have... I posted something on my UFO Classified Facebook page about Bob Lazar with regard to Stanton Friedman's research, basically debunking Lazar, and that has solicited some very interesting comments, including comments from uh, world-renowned physicist uh, Dr. Eric Davis. So if you get a second, go in and check out the UFO Classified Facebook page and let me know what you think. Add your comments there. There is a new movie coming out uh, with Jeremy Corbell. It's his movie, uh, George Knapp, Bob Lazar. So we will see uh, what people think about that. And I also encourage people to look at all of the research that has been done historically on specific cases like this case. Without further ado, though, one of my dear friends in the subject, in fact, I feel, I mean, I, I must talk to Greg. Gosh, how many times a week, Greg, do we talk? Uh, sometimes, a, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes a couple, sometimes less, depending on what's going on, <laughs> depending on what news is coming through, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, it, I always have such a, a great time. You're, you have been very helpful to me, and I always, I learn a, a lot, and I want to just tell my listeners, if you don't know who Greg Bishop is, you need to know, because in my opinion, he is one of the most logical diligent researchers in the field. In 1991, Greg co-founded a magazine called The Excluded Middle, which I need to get in my library. And that was a journal on UFOs, conspiracy, research, psychedelia, psychedelia and new science. Uh, he also did a great book. I've got one of them right in front of me called Project Beta, the story of Paul Benowitz, National Security and the Creation of the Modern UFO Myth from December of 2007 to 2011. Greg blogged for the UFO paranormal site UFO Mystic. He has a book out called It Defies Language, another great book. And he is a licensed FAA pilot to fly uh, commercial drones, which is very cool. So, I mean, Greg, you, the last time. And planes. I, and planes. Oh, wow. It just never. Well, I got I had that first, and I thought, hey, I got a pilot's license. I can I can actually be paid for drone work. But now the FAA changed it, so um, anybody can do it. Uh, they just have to go through a course. But yeah, I, I got the pilot's license first because I wanted one all my life. Everybody wants to fly when they're kids. It just never left me. <laughs> mm, you know that that wasn't first on my mind, but I can see why you would be attracted to that. <laughs> okay, a lot of people do <laughs> want to fly when they're kids. It just never left. I know. Not I'm, everybody. Just, I'm kidding. You you recently came to to Salt Lake again, which I was super stoked about because you and your lovely wife came to my Halloween party, my mm -hmm. annual Halloween party that I, I have never missed a year since I was 16 years old, and of course, you know the it it doesn't go as late as it used to. <laughs> But there's one thing you can always count on, and that's the little Soul Train dance off, as as frightening as that may be. Yeah, and I appreciate I you humoring me. You, 
<laughs> made me do it. Yeah, well, um, it was it was uh, we couldn't come till the week after Halloween because of Sigrid's uh, uh, library convention. So you held it over a week for us, which I appreciate. Well, it was really fun for all my friends to meet you, and I I appreciate that. And it's it's always great to take you different places. We went to uh, tea at at Grand America. High tea, which was very cool. And then we also went to a really cool kind of off the beaten path bookstore, used bookstore called Ken Sanders and spent some time there. Wish we could have spent more time there, but we both found a couple interesting things. And I was surprised at how much they had with regard to uh, UFO literature, cattle, cattle mutilations. I could have spent, I mean, I, just, I want to go back there again. Yeah, that's an amazing place. I got all kinds of books. I'm probably like six UFO books and then various other things like the Bureau of Amer- American Ethnology report from 1886 about the Zuni, something I've been looking for for a while. Um, and a copy of The Curious Amorist, <laughs> which is one of the most silly books I've ever seen. It's a, like a 1930s softcore porno novel. I guess that's what been would have been called then. But the language in it is so... So intricate and flat. It's one of those things where you can't quite exactly tell what he's talking about because the language is so um, oblique, I guess, which makes it wonderful. I'm, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna read passages from from it on my show at some point. But yeah, we saw. Um, we we found a lot of UFO books, and I don't like going into um, used bookstores with other friends of mine that are UFO book junkies because we're like, wow, well, we're like <laughs> thumbing through the titles really fast so you can find what first. I forget. I can't forget what. Uh, I mean, I can't remember what you found. Where I went, oh, damn it! Oh, I what found the find? cattle mutilations report. Oh, the Ken Rommel report. Yeah. Yep, yep. From the I think it's seventy eight or nine something I like that. I think it was a little bit later, and I wish I had it here, but I took it over it to my later. library. Uh, yeah, that was the report that the that Harrison Schmidt, the state senator from New Mexico, commissioned, I think, I guess in 1979 or 80, to get an official uh, read on the cattle mutilation phenomenon because people were, ranchers were up in arms at the time. And Rommel came in, and apparent, uh, Gabe Valdez told me, he said he never, he the closest he'd ever been to a cow was a steak at the restaurant. That was one thing he said about him. And the other one is he said they, they did no investigation, really, because there was nothing at one, because they were lazy, and I guess they already had a foregone conclusion. This is what Gabe said. And two, and other people have said this, too. And two, um, they the uh, as, as Gabe and ranchers and other people said, at the time they were doing the study, the mutilations dropped off. The anomalous mutilations seemed to, seemed to go away when – when Rommel and his team were out there, quote unquote, investigating. So they, they concluded it was all predator um, uh, kills, uh, misidentified. You know, it's interesting. I have a, a long lost acquaintance that I've known for 25 years. And, and out of the blue, uh, we con- he contacted me and I spoke with him and he's in the military. Um, but he, back in 74, was a 17-year-old. He was up in a cattle ranch. Uh, on the Utah-Idaho border, and there were several very significant cattle mutilations uh, to which he was witness of, and he said that something happened on the last night that he decided he was going to stay there, and there was so much radiation around the cow that had been mutilated that he, they, he, and he'd also seen some other things, which he's, I need to meet him and hear more details, but it, it really really frightened him what kind of radiation you know what i'll get more details yeah ionizing which doesn't last very long i guess or the kind that's emitted from radioactive materials because chris o'brien and also i think uh dave perkins have said and you know they just they pointed this out they didn't say this is a reason or this is solving the mystery or anything that um the vast majority i may may have said all Cattle mutilation, spates of cattle mutilations are downstream or downwind from nuclear facilities, dump facilities, um, research facilities, and power plants, which is a weird one. It doesn't mean that they're out there checking, you know, somebody's out there checking for radiation and that's the solution to the whole thing, but it's an interesting, large piece of the puzzle, I think. Right. And Chris O'Brien, I mean, he's done a lot of research. I really respect his work um, on, on that. 
what else have you been up to lately? Because every time I talk to you, you are talking to people that I want to talk to and, and just these I, you know, your, your shows like Gabe Valdez. I mean, you, you interviewed him, you went and visited him and what else, what else have you been doing? I saw Gabe multiple times. I mean, to the point where every time we went out there, him and his wife, Margie would take us out to dinner at a new Mexican restaurant and be very polite, nice to us. And we'd hang out and talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, I, I went to Gabe's funeral when, when he died, age 69 in his sleep. Uh, I, <laughs> Uh, he was buried where he where he grew up in Saboya, New Mexico, halfway between Albuquerque and Dulce, actually. So, will you tell people about Gabe and then and his son, who you've met with, and and give people a little background because I'm afraid most of my listeners are like, "What's happening?" <laughs> oh, oh, well, Gabe Valdez. I'm sorry, I should have backgrounded. No, I, I should have done that. Talking. I should have. That's my that's my job as a host. I should be doing that, but you know. Either way, I mean, I, I, I often ask people on my show, it's like, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because I haven't done my own homework. <laughs> so, um, Gabe uh, was a New Mexico State police officer. Um, and he his beat was around the Dulce area. So he knew all the people, which is a uh, Apache, uh, Hickory Apache Indian Reservation uh, in the extreme northwest corner of New Mexico. Um, sometime in the late seventies, a lot of, uh, it was one of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, um, ground zero for, uh, cattle mutilation phenomenon, uh, that, that four corners area. Uh, and Gabe was the state highway patrol officer there. So he investigated a lot of these things and naturally became interested into, you know, who, why, what's going on. And, um, he worked with the tribe there. He worked with the tribal police. He worked with the ranchers out there and, um, so he told me all about that. I met him when I was working on Project Beta, uh, became friends with him then, and, and, and just kept visiting with him. He died, uh, oh God, I guess about five years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, living in Albuquerque at the time with his family. Um, and his son saved all of his files. Um, I think his family was about to throw it out, and his son Greg said, no, 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 don't throw that stuff away. Um, so he all of his files from, you know, all of his research, um, all of his time doing uh, work for uh, uh, various agencies and, and uh, uh, private agencies and agencies of the government on the cattle mutilation phenomenon. And he said that um, uh, he would he would write a book, and he did. It was called Dulce Base, and I had him on my show talking about that. Uh, and uh, I think he's planning to write another book, too, so he's going to use some more of these files, I guess. Anyway, um, I, I I told him that I might help him out with some of this, so I make I make to see some more of this, uh, some more of uh, what Gabe was working on uh, in the years that I knew him that either I didn't know about or he couldn't talk about or whatever. So see, and that, I just, that's interesting. Well, I mean, I, every time I talk to you, I'm just amazed at the history that you have. I mean, it, the history that you've made in fostering these relationships and actually getting in your car and going out and visiting people like Gabe and his son. And I, I'm really excited to see where this is going to lead. Yeah. I don't, I actually don't know where it's going to lead, but I, I, you know, he was very, Gabe at the time was free with what he could be with what, what he showed me and what his suspicion at the time was, which I still think is a very distinct possibility was that, um, some, most, maybe of the cattle mutilations have to do with monitoring something that got into the uh, natural environment uh, in, in the Southwest, and that uh, it was experimental or it wasn't supposed to be there or it was from a biological, you know, uh, weapons or, or, or genetic research or something like that. Anyway, they were trying very desperately not to ruin the beef industry and all that by trying to figure out what was going on. Um, the kind of uh, fly in that ointment was, you know, uh, somebody else had pointed to me out to me. Why don't they just go down to a slaughterhouse and ask for certain organs and stuff like that so they can trace it? Medical companies do that. So, um, like like Chris has said and Dave Perkins has said, uh, there's no one explanation for the cattle mutilation phenomenon that makes that makes total sense and answers all the questions. It's it just doesn't. Um, anything from something very mundane like. Uh, uh, 
where you know where the cow was found and how it was found and how long it's been there and you know normal necropsy type things that go on with with dead animals and how long they've been there to extremely strange things like finding chemicals that make people sick um uh uh, sub- substances that are used for immunizations and animals, animals, but uh, extremely high concentrations of them, radiation uh, residue, as you say, um, all kinds of things, and uh, evidence of being dropped from a great height uh, because the legs and ribs and things are broken. Uh, so somehow they've been lifted off the ground, and there's little ligature marks on the legs showing they've been picked up by something, either a clamp or a rope or something like that. So. Uh, it's, it's not, not, not every explanation makes sense. And so what, what role did Gabe have, uh, working with Robert Bigelow? Uh, I think he was, um, he was assigned to do work for him on the cattle mutilation stuff for, uh, sometime in the early thousands, I guess, for a few years. And he's, and, um, he, uh, I guess he just, you know, he never told me about that work, but he, he would go out to mutilation sites um, and I guess turn in a report. Um, and I've never seen any of those reports. Uh, I, I, I guess, I, I guess that Bigelow still has them, but um, he was under a non-disclosure agreement. So I, I never saw any of that stuff. Well, and it's interesting because that's what uh, Colm Kelleher seems to be interested in as well. So hopefully we'll find more out, but I'm really excited that you're, you are digging into this. That's cool. And also Chris Lambright, you've had him on recently. So describe a little bit about Chris, give us his background and what happened on the show. Well, Chris is, uh, I saw him fine. I knew about him for years. He wrote a book called X descending, which came out uh, a couple of years after project great, I guess, 2008. If I get it wrong, I'm sorry, Chris. Um, I met him at a conference in uh, Santa Fe uh, last year, or this earlier this year, and um, he knew. He it turns out he had looked at the Paul Benowitz story and what was going on at the Air Force Base there. That's uh, described in my book, and he had slightly different viewpoints on them and uh, and different ideas about timelines. And when I talked to him about this and realized this, and that he said that he thought he knew what they were testing out there, or at least the nature of it. Um, you know, because Benowitz took uh, video and film of these strange objects uh, flying around Kirtland Air Force Base in the middle of the night in the winter uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And that's how he got involved with the Air Force and how that whole story started. Um, Chris had talked, he had known Paul Benowitz, had talked to him extensively and uh, had, you know, had a kind of a working relationship with him for quite a few years. So he had, you know, he was a firsthand witness, at least to Paul Benowitz and uh, had uh, had some insights uh, about Benowitz and and what had happened over that period and you know when you know when certain things had happened that I might have gotten wrong in my timeline. Uh, so we had a discussion about that and then I had him on my show and we talked about it because if I've got a mistake somewhere, I'm not going to sit there and say, well, you didn't do the research and you're wrong. It's like I want to know what you have because I want to set the record straight. So we did on minor things there and especially about maybe what the Air Force was testing out there, which had to do with laser propulsion. And so, and Josh Kutchin, you've had him on your show. I mean, you've like, honestly, I don't know where, well, I know you do a lot of work, but I just want to say you have the most interesting guests out of any show, hands down, that I've ever seen. I just had to say that. Well, you know what? I used to do the show every week, and then I finally got tired of, I'm going to find somebody for next week. So I just decided, look, I am not, beholden to anybody i don't have any advertisers i don't have any subscribers i don't have a patreon i have nothing where where i have a responsibility to anybody except myself and my guests and that's the way i want to keep it so when i do shows it's with somebody that i think is interesting we have something interesting to talk about i I will not say well i need to get somebody this week so i'm just going to fill in with whoever which is kind of what i used to do every once in a while and you have to when you do these shows you can't, you know, you can't have somebody on every week. It's like, oh my God, I've been waiting to talk to this person for 10 years. It just doesn't work that way. Um, I have repeat people on my show. It's just people that I like and we have interesting conversations. But um, the upshot of this is instead of doing it every week, I will put out maybe three shows a month, sometimes two, um, maybe more sometimes. But it's only when I have, you know, 
I have set up an interview with somebody and we've taken the time to um, uh, talk about something in depth, into, you know, the way I like to talk about it. And also, you know, BS time. I had Massimo Teodorani on my show uh, a few weeks ago. He's an Italian astrophysicist. We talked about uh, plasma physics and how he has discovered, and other scientists too, that that some forms of plasma, which is the third state of matter, or fourth, I'm sorry, after solid, li liquid, and gas, that's what the sun is, it's plasma, um, apparently seems to have some sort of uh, conscious uh, uh, awareness or uh, a consciousness about it or something that would be called that. Um, that's an interesting development. Uh, and I think he knows uh, Erling Strand and has been at Hestel and, and, and has uh, talked to him about this idea. And uh, he talked to me about this on my show and about um, films they had taken showing structure with inside these plasma plasmas that were flying over Hestel and in other places. And that, that's quite interesting to me. Always slightly above my head, but that's what I love having people on my show that are either slightly or way above my head because then I and the audience learn. Right. Absolutely. And, and I actually, I spoke with him about three weeks ago and it's, I mean, I, I, like you, I love learning from people like that. He, both he and Erling and Ted Rowe had gone to a place in Southern Arizona that I went to, and I've told you about it and talked about it on the show before. Uh, we went there to do field research and this is kind of a little known place and I'm not going to divulge the the location because none of them did. But uh, Dr. Taylor Rani mentioned mentioned this and has written about this before. So it's it's I mean these are such great people to learn from. And that is really, really cool that you had them on on your show. Yeah, Again, and then the just, yeah, last I mean, twenty minutes all we talked about was flying and and and, and his music. And I like that. I didn't. I didn't care. We didn't talk about you know uh, 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 sentient plasmas the whole time. Uh, uh, we just naturally started talking about other stuff, and that's the way the show went. And I'm going to have to have him back on. Well, I hope you do because that's. I he's one of my heroes. I really do like him, and I don't think a lot of people know about him or the importance of his work here in America because we're so busy focusing on. I don't know whatever we're focusing on stupidity. <laughs> We're focusing on what's placed in front of us and fighting about it. That's what we focus on. And so I, I, that's because that's why I have my do not engage t-shirt. It's just most of the stuff online is are people defending territories, defending some emotional thing, they, some emotional uh, opinion they have, their egos, all this stuff. And it's very hard to get information and, and uh, anything useful exchanged that way, which is why I tend to back off a lot of these things. And um, if I see somebody saying something interesting, I will send them a little message. It's like, hey, would you like to talk? Um, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But most of the time they say, yeah, yeah, let's talk. And uh, eventually, you know, if I'm lucky, they end up on the show. And if not, at least I have somebody to talk to and, and refer to and ask questions of, which is just as valuable or more to me than having them on the show. Well, and I, f I feel the same way you do. And I think that both both you and I spend a lot of time getting to know the person that is on our show, like doing research. I mean, there, there. I don't think there's, oh, and there's the music, so we've got to take a break, but I want to talk a little bit more about this when we get back. I'm Erica Luke's here with Greg Bishop. Stick around. We will be back after the break. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Luke's. Erica Luke's. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Toxins are everywhere, from the air we breathe to the food we eat and the water we drink. In a world where 80,000 known toxins and heavy metals threaten our very existence, how are you going to protect yourself and your loved ones? 
Introducing Pure Body Extra Strength, the world's first collodial zeolite that helps trap and remove toxins as well as heavy metals from your body that are messing with your memory, clarity, sleep, and focus. Don't just take our word for it or the testimonials from our thousands of happy customers. Check out the hundreds of articles and case studies on the National Institute of Health website proving zeolite's powerful ability to remove toxins. For a limited time, listeners to KCOR will receive 10% off their first order. To get started, go to trypurebody.com and enter promo code radio 10 again that's trypurebody.com toxic junk is all around us but now you can take back control of your health and protect yourself by detoxing with pure body extra strength you'll be on your way to sleeping better thinking more clearly and feeling more energetic go to trypurebody.com right now and get started today was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring. Why? Anyone? 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 Because they were huddled around the fire listening to the KCOR Digital Radio Network Home for the Holiday Special. Brilliant! Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, Christmas Eve, it's commercial-free holiday music. Yes! This Christmas music! It's joyful and triumphant. Our gift to you from the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Good afternoon, everyone. This is your captain. I'd like to welcome you on Jackpot Airlines Flight 1610, service to lost wages. They say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, apparently, they need a reality check done Vegas style. Vegas, 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 Vegas! Tune in Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, for Reality Check, hosted by Jessica Johns, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Biggest star in the world, big than Britney and Christina put together. If it's happening on the Vegas Strip, you'll know about it here first. You are a dirty little fun haver. Join Jessica Johns as she explores and goes behind the scenes of what's hot and what's not. From the best entertainment Vegas has to offer to national celebrity gossip. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Jessica has her finger on the heartbeat of the city and she's waiting to share it with you. Reality Check, hosted by Jessica Johns, Wednesday, 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern. She does Vegas right. Yeah, baby! (laughs) This is Reverend Sean Whittington. On behalf of KCORradio.com, GhostBegone.biz, and Vegas Supernatural... I would like to wish all my listeners out there a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and the happiest of New Year's. May all your dreams come true. Good luck and God bless. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas. You're listening to, listening to. You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name, KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at kcorradio.com. The audience goes nuts! And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. I'm Erica Lukes. I hope you are having a wonderful Friday evening. And of course, I'm trying to stay out of trouble, but it never seems to happen, even though I've been sick with the stomach flu all week. So if I sound a little bit deflated this evening, you'll know that I'm just not up to my usual self, but having my friend uh, and respected colleague Greg Bishop on the show makes me feel much better, and the second hour, Travis Walton will be coming to the show, and I'm excited about that. Next week, I will be interviewing Richard Thiem, who is, if you don't know who Richard Thiem is, definitely go check him out. You can see some of his videos at DEF CON, and he is very skilled in the world of hacking, so this is going to be a great show. I look forward to having him on 
But right now I am here with Greg and we were talking about, we've been talking about so much, all of the great people, Chris Lambright, some of the wonderful people that you've interviewed. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Diana Pasolka and the interview that you did with her, because in my opinion, this is a very pivotal interview in lots of ways. She wrote, Diana Pasolka wrote a book called American Cosmic. If you don't have that, I would definitely recommend that. But Greg, what were your thoughts on your conversation with her about the book? Uh, I had, she hadn't finished the book when we were talking. Uh, It's finished now. It's going to be released on the 2nd of January. You can pre-order it now, I think on Amazon. Uh, But uh, I was introduced to her in September. September of last year, I think uh, we talked. Or it was October. We talked over a couple of months. Um, we talked. She talked about who she had, uh, you know, not directly because she doesn't. She will not. She she can't betray the confidences of the people she talked to. A lot of them. Um, but she told me about who she had talked to, what they had talked about. It, it, it's all in the book, and um, um, maybe some of the implications. And if people don't know Diana Walsh Pasolka is a professor of religious studies at, uh, and she's the head of the religious studies department at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She just got hit a couple, uh, about a month ago with that very bad hurricane. Uh, it came ashore right, it, I mean, it, hit, it made landfall right on top of the university, so they got hit pretty hard. Um, anyway, American Cosmic is uh, about two different things, really. Uh, one is uh, what is the um, what is the effect uh, on scientists, researchers, academics who actually believe that there is some there's something to the UFO subject? What do they think about it? How does it affect their lives? In a lot of ways, um, they seem like high level contactees. Like they'll say, "Well, I got this idea. Well, where'd you get it? Well, um, the aliens gave it to me. What?" But the, the point is that these people, some of them work in, you know, on, on, in high positions and uh, high level of uh, research and, and, uh, and in the military, uh, military research for technology and other technologies, too. Um, and that they're <laughs> you would think if they admitted this to their higher ups, they'd say, uh, OK, uh, sorry, uh, we don't want you really talking like that. So please, you know, here's, here's your last check and go. Uh, the the point of part of the point of this book is they don't hear that from their superiors. Their superiors either say, "Look, if it works, we don't care. Go ahead, get messages from aliens." And some of these people have gotten what they say messages from somewhere else that tell them how to make things, invent things, develop things that we use all the time. Um, you know, she doesn't say this in the book, and this is, I'm just making this up literally, but like, say there's a part in your cell phone, somebody that worked on that cell phone would say that um, some aliens from some planet told, told them how that worked and how to, how to, how to conceptualize it. Now, you know, it made them, it made them, it made them famous, not famous, but it made them a uh, good deal of money from the patent and all that, but they didn't say the idea came from them. Like musicians say, the idea doesn't come from them, it comes through them. That's what some of these scientists say. And the other part of the book is uh, examination of how people believe things, why they believe things um, under the lens of, uh, you know, obviously religion, uh, because a lot of a lot of the UFO thing has to do with you can't you can't get around that a lot of it has to do with belief, because this stuff cannot be um, uh, demonstrated on demand. So. You know, she examines uh, what is the media atmosphere that causes people to believe certain things. Um, uh, why do they believe certain things? Why do they act on these beliefs? Uh, and you know, and how can these beliefs be controlled very easily if you're not careful? If you don't realize who's controlling your beliefs, uh, those are just a few of the issues in the book. And uh, it's uh, it, it, I, I got a, I, a few people, people got reviews, review copies. I got one. So I was, I was able to take a look at it recently. Well, I, I, I keep track of her and she's, she is very quiet on Facebook and then you'll see things from her. And I wish her the best because she is a very, she's a wonderful human being. Yeah. Plus she's, you know, every, uh, I do talk to her every once in a while. Um, not, not too often, but when she does, it's always, um, 
it's always inspirational. I mean, that's the only word I can say about it. And uh, I think that uh, the reason she's a little more quiet now is one, there's, you know, <laughs> they're cleaning up the school after the, the hurricane still. And, um, and two, the book's just about to come out. So everybody's coming at her from every direction. It's like, can I have an interview? What about this? Can you tell us who this is? You know, what's this guy's real name? And she's like, look, I can't do that. But so she's kind of juggling schedules uh, right now. She's very busy right now, frighteningly busy. Well, and it's interesting. And, and it looks like on Amazon, though, that you can get her book right now. You can, but it's a pre order. Okay, okay. I think it says pre-order. If it doesn't, that's it, it, then they've released it early because it supposedly comes out on January second or third, something. Like yeah, that. I don't know. That's why I was confused. I thought that it had come out, but I will double check that. But which I mean, I would definitely tell listeners to put that on your agenda because this is yeah. is an important book. So I think it's probably it. It just pushes all my buttons. It might not push everybody else's buttons. But it does for me, just my background and the people I've talked to, the people I'm interested in, my history, all the way back to Bill Moore and, um, and uh, everything that was in my magazine and the, the mystical side of it and the belief side of it and how do people's beliefs work and all that. Those are all really interesting to me. So the book becomes quite interesting to me. Um, my impression of the book is that um, some people in the UFO community will think it's, it's incredible and a breakthrough and wonderful. And I think... A lot of them are just going to, I think, maybe confused by it or just it not confused, but just like, well, this isn't very important. It doesn't it's not part of the agenda that we're we're uh, we're um, running, pursuing and uh, we think will bear fruit. Um, I happen to not agree with most of the UFO community about what the way the way they go about things will bear fruit. But um, that, that's, you know, I'm not going to fight with them about it uh, uh, to me. um uh, Diana Pasolka's book is a, a very important um, piece in the puzzle, certainly in my puzzle and the people that I know and like and 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 respect. They, 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 uh, th these are the kind of things we talk about, and she just takes it to the next level. So that that there's my uh, what did I say about the book the other day? If something about if you're if you're interested in what's in the book and the subject matter she talks about, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're interested in that direction of, uh, at least of UFO study and uh, other things related to it, you will not be able to put it down. And I, I love that. And I, I have to just say, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, you have mentioned that some people think that you are a skeptic and, you know, because you're not towing the company line, you know, you're not falling into the kind of maybe the cultish belief systems that we see in the UFO community. And that's one of the things that attracted me to you because I appreciated the fact that you're so, you're very logical, but you also understand where the BS line is and all of these different things. And so I think that's really, I, I respect what you have to say well, is what you. I'm trying to say. Well, thanks very much, Erica. I think you do too. And the, the 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 point about the BS line, I don't even know where that is anymore. Except, I talked to a, a college class yesterday, UC Irvine. Every every uh, semester, I go and talk to uh, a class um, in this professor's uh, program, and I said, uh, "You can't you can't go into this with a belief system, a fixed belief system, or." an emotional uh, tie to any of it or um, an ego in it or anything like that. Because as soon as that stuff starts creeping in, you're going to start shutting yourself off to different uh, aspects. And yeah, there's a lot of BS and there's a lot of questionable stuff. I think it's probably mostly questionable, but it's endlessly fascinating. The people are fascinating. The subject's fascinating. The, the implications of the subject are fascinating. Um, like we said about belief, how people believe what they believe and why they do and how they defend it. That's all fascinating stuff. And um, I prefer to kind of, you know, I know I'm in the subject with a, and, and I have friends and I have opinions, but I sort of prefer to stand back and kind of watch what's going on and not really say too much until I really have made a decision about something or something's really interesting to me. So I almost mo never make a decision about something in this field. You just, just can't. And the only thing that, you know, 
I go to a lecture and people say, well, it doesn't sound like you take any stock in any of this. I said, no, that, it's not what I'm saying at all. Um, and in fact, to make you feel better, I'll tell you exactly how I feel. I feel that there is something that is not human that interacts with us occasionally, but that's as far as I'm, I'm going to take it. And if you, you know, if you accept that, or I, you know, I pretty much accept that, um, then, you know, everything's interesting. It's just that some things are more interesting to me than others, like talking to Massimo or talking to you or having David Perkins on my show or, you know, uh, reading Diana's book or whatever. Those things are interesting to me. Um, you know, fi figuring out if, um, like somebody told me about the, what was the Irish uh, 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 airliner stuff from last month or a couple weeks ago. A couple of people were saying, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And I said, it proves that people see UFOs once in a while. We knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And it's, it's, it's UFO porno, you know? It's just like, okay, here's some more stuff for people to get excited that there were lights in the sky. Yes, there are lights in the sky. Yes, they're unexplained. But, you know, most people I know who I respect are way past that. It's like, you know, why are there lights in the sky? Why do people see them? How do they see them? What happens to them after they see them? Um, what happens when they're closer? You know, stuff like that. Right. And and I, I have always said that I think we just are really short sighted in in this field because we're always looking at a single case and we're not looking at the bigger picture. Or like you said, you know, what this does, who who is likely to see this, how that has shaped their lives, what happens before and after sighting. You know, there's so many questions and I I, I love it. It's perplexing. I don't know what to do, but we, I do have a question in chat uh, from Libertas, and he wants to know, in regard to unknown craft, do you subscribe more to the extraterrestrial, interdimensional, or none of the above? None, really. <laughs> okay. No, I, I don't, you know, I, I've said, I think I, uh, in one of my lectures, a couple of them actually, I said, you know, what, what, to me, what's the most important uh, question to me? To me, I'm not saying this is other people's. But the most important question is what causes UFO reports? Not what, not where do they come from? Not do are people lying or not? Not is this really happening or not? Not should we prove this to the mainstream media or, or uh, uh, academia or not? What causes the reports? And that's a very wide ranging question. Um, you know, what causes somebody to see one, see something that's anomalous like that, a light in the sky, or maybe something even closer? Um, how do they process it? What happens after they process it? How does the human mind process this stuff? You know, um, we're looking we're looking at the results of a recording instrument, which is not is far from objective, and we treat it as if it's objective. And like, if you're talking about colors and things like that, maybe you know, maybe you can say that. But past that, I think th a lot of UFO reports get into very subjective areas. And that, that's actually pretty interesting. I think we should de dive into that subjectivity and see what we can see what comes out of it. Um, it's not amenable to charts and graphs and data and all that. It's more the realm of you know sociology and, and creativity and things like that. But I mean, and, that, and that's the thing. It's like we look at you know organizations like MUFON, and they've done a great job at collecting data and also. Uh, creating in with some chapters a very safe place for people to express their experiences. Yeah, it's but important. it is very important. But it, but at the end of the day, what has been gleaned from from that, you know? And so I think taking a different approach is good. And I also think not having, you know, with MUFON, there's this very even though some people don't feel this way involved in MUFON, but there's this very black and white, put it in a box, dismiss it if it doesn't fit in this box. Yeah. Or, you know, here's an important case. I think it's going to break it open. How can this, how can this make my career? It's like, uh, that's not what's supposed to be going on. You've already taken it out of the realm of, of uh, uh, objective um, study as much as possible and made it very subjective. And the the more subjective I think you make this this subject, the more you know, at least publicly, the the, the less you know about it. Conversely, I think the more the may, you make it subjective individually, the more meaning you get out of it. But that can't be made into TV shows, books, or anything else that people can make money off of or get attention for. Um, but it's really important to the person that's had the experience. How do they um, how do they process that experience? 
And it's important to let them process that experience and to let them express what they want instead of shoving a, a, a meaning down their throat. It's like, okay, this is what you saw. Um, I, I think I told you this, Erica. I, I, th- uh, I thought I thought of a good way to um, my my. F- I, I would like to try an experiment and be a UFO uh, uh, abduction researcher and a- arrive on the scene not with a tape recorder but with a giant pad of paper and colored pencils and pens and erasers and things like that and put them in front of the the witness and say, "Here you go. Um, do whatever you want with these to to uh, describe or or." Um, you know, work through your feelings with what happened to you. Bye, and leave for a couple of days. Leave them alone. Don't lead them. Don't do anything. Just let them do whatever. And if you if you want to call me, you can go ahead. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask you I'm not gonna ask you a set of questions designed to lead you down a certain road, whether I think I'm doing it or not. And that it's difficult. And I mean, I know when I first started investigating this, or I look at some of the early interviews, I, I did uh, a video interview with a girl that, that worked uh, near Area 51, and I can look back at that and see how much I led her, or how much I interjected my experiences into what she had seen. Yeah, and so we not, learned... It's natural. Yeah, and, and so we just... It, it's a difficult thing, especially when, you know, none of us are, are trained. There's no school of ufology or, I mean, we're all coming at this with different backgrounds. And so it makes it, uh, it's, yeah, it's, there's, it's, there's no professional way to look at it. And there's no organized way to look at it because the subject is not organized. I, I'm wearing my t-shirt now that actually uh, my, uh, the actual t-shirt, I, one of my t-shirts, it says mimic the, the obliqueness of the subject. You can't solve an illogical thing with logic. Uh, I, I I think that's part of the problem with, with studying UFOs. I don't know what the answer is. I'm sorry if somebody's like, well, then what is the answer? Lead us to whatever. It's like, I don't have that. All I have is suggestions that I think would be helpful in um, studying this going into the future, meaning don't lead the witness, um, don't have a preconception, um, maybe do away with hypnosis for a while and see what happens there. Although, you know, keep the groups and the therapists so that people have a place to go. Um Various things like this, you know, uh, look at people's inner life rather than, you know, what, what, than collecting data and putting it in charts. So, uh, and that's, I don't think a, an organization is set up for that kind of thing. Maybe a small group or individuals would be a lot better at, at uh, hammering away at this than a, than, a, than a large national group. You know, I think it's interesting because you bring up hypnotherapy and I have to say again, if you're you know, you, you have these incredible experiences and you're looking for some answers and then you go out there and it's ET and you get kind of thrown down that rabbit hole. And most of the, the hypnotherapists are all of the mindset that this is extraterrestrial when that might not be the case. So how do you find a hypnotherapist that would be impartial to that? Um, I guess you'd have to ask around and look and say, look, it, Find a professional and say, if I come to you with this, could you please not encourage or dissuade me about what I'm talking about? I would just like to talk to you about what happened to me, wherever that may lead. And the other thing is, you know what? If somebody says aliens visited them and did whatever they were going to do, if it's bothering them, then that needs to be worked through and the person needs to be you know, taken care of and, 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 uh, and got, gotten to the point where they don't have to feel frightened or weird about their experiences. And if they can get to that point, great. I actually don't care what their belief is at that point. As long as they feel better, I think that's the most important thing. Um, but uh, past that, finding out what's going on, I think, I think leaving people alone more to say what they want to say might, might open some doors that we don't even know exist yet. And so what would we do with this, with this data? I mean, that's like the big million dollar question. I don't know what we do with this data, but I do know that w- what we could do with and ways of treating people that come to you with these, with these, uh, with these experiences, not you know, a, a technique for treating them rather than a way of categorizing it. Uh, I, 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 I can't be any more specific than that right now because it's it seems that when you go to certain abduction researchers, they have a certain idea and they get you into their group and that becomes the group think and all that. And maybe that's okay if they feel better. 
but it's not really answering the question about you know uh, what's going on. And in, in fact, from an abduction standpoint, maybe we will never really know the answer because it's so covered up with our expectations, the, the researchers' expectations, and maybe even whatever you know, whatever entity, at intelligence, or whatever take uh, is affecting them. I, I I don't know how many layers are there that we have to get through to get to the, the core of it. And I don't know what the core of it is, but um, dealing with people's feelings, emotions, impressions, and healing is probably something that should be concentrated concentrated on at this point. And I think some of the answers will come through not trying to figure out who's doing what. Who is this? Where are they coming from? What is their purpose? It's like, that's a science fiction way of looking at it. Why don't we just deal with the people that are uh, that are having the experiences and what their experiences are and how do they how do they go about integrating it into their you know into their inner and outer lives so that they don't have to feel scared weird whatever about it and also not you know <laughs> suddenly feel like they have to start a religion around it or anything because that's another pathology I think but um, it's uh, it the witness should take and I think people are realizing this at this point that the witness should take. Uh, uh, center stage, at least uh, in research, and not, not, I don't mean center stage like, you know, making books and movies about their experiences, but um, uh, dealing with what their experience is rather than what people think it is. Right. Well, I mean, there, this is such a complex subject, and there's so many areas to focus on. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I... I <laughs> I have a few different areas of focus at the moment, but I mean, those are, oh, who does those are, I mean, but it's, that's, what's so fun about this. I mean, I've got, uh, I mean, I've, I am, I have more notes. I mean, you probably have this, the same amount of notes. I mean, you know, you, you are meticulous as well, but I have notes and notes and notes that go back years and years and years. And I'm talking to the same people and, and then, you know, it's like something will click in six months and then in a year, and then you'll see this bigger pattern. And it's like, yeah, Oh my God. Really patient. If you're a researcher, you have to be really, keep your ears open, turn off the damn filters <clears throat> and sit with it for years sometimes before things start to connections start to happen and make sense. And your connections may not be other people's connections. But if you can talk about it in a civilized manner with people who don't make the same connections as you, maybe, you know, some progress can be made that way. And also, you know, there's the, the physical evidence and, and, and trace cases and the possible metamaterials and all that stuff. That's a whole other part of the equation, which might not even be related to the abduction thing, which many people have pointed out already. So, Greg, thank you so much for being here. I want to say you are a dear friend, and I really respect you. Go to RadioMysterioso.com. We will be right back, so stick around. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. Uh, this is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Luke's upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. And the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the software. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact.
fiction, or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Welcome back, and and thank you so much for getting into chat. I appreciate all of your comments and all of the support that I get from all over the world. I love the fact that all of my listeners are respectful and want good knowledge. Every week I try to bring you people that I feel can give you information and you can learn something and hopefully we can instill a sense of excitement in a younger generation and not lead them down the wrong uh, paths. My guest this evening is someone who I've wanted to have on the show for a long, long time and someone that I've watched over his his career, at least my career, in the UFO lecture circuit. I don't think I've ever met a human being that is more uh, just kind. Uh, this isn't about him. What he experienced was very profound and very deep that I've ever met. I feel, I mean, this is this is an honor for me, so I'm going to try not to get too excited. Travis, I have to say that it is, like I said, it's an honor for you to be here, but I want to just tell my guests, if you don't know about Travis Walton, then I don't know what to tell you. That's, that's a little embarrassing, but on November 5th, 1975, Travis uh, disappeared in Snowflake, Arizona, and there has been a lot that have that has come out about his life. This was very, very intense for him. And I know that he has spent his life trying to get information out about this experience. And he's been very brave in doing that. And, and Travis, I just, I could, I could go into all of these details, but I want to say thank you for being here. And when I have had the pleasure of being in your company, you have really struck me as such a kind and sincere individual. And this is never, I can tell, this has never for you been about something that is is making you money or getting you popular with the ladies. This is about you doing the right thing and helping other people feel like they are they can be accepted for their profound experiences. Well, that's what I hope to achieve. Well, I, so I know that you you have to talk about your experience all the time, and so if there's if there is something that is that you want to talk about, I would love to talk about that. So you don't have to rehash things, but if you want to, that's great. I just I want I want to learn something new about you, and I want my audience to understand how important what you have done has been. You know, let's talk about just really, really briefly the initial sighting just to get everybody into this, this story and what, what happened. So if you don't mind just really briefly doing that. All right. November 5th, 1975. It was a Wednesday, you know, an ordinary work day, middle of the week. And, uh, we finished a long, hard day's work and, uh, uh, worked right up to sundown, and uh, we were headed out of there. It was getting dark, and as we were uh, leaving on this d- dirt road, uh, we uh, spotted a glow coming through the trees, uh, and it was just sort of a gradually dawning awareness, but, uh, you know, we weighed all the possibilities of what it might be because it was definitely something out of the place because, you know, the, the woods are normally dark at night. But uh, it, nothing, you know, none of the possible explanations were really fitting in. It wasn't the sun going down. It wasn't the moon. It wasn't, wasn't uh, deer hunters camping up there on the ridge. Um, finally, you know, it was just curious. I said, Mike, hurry up. Get up there where we can see. Because uh, we could see where there was a break in the trees and the glow was, uh, you know, uh, shining across the road ahead. When we got up there, we saw the UFO. There it was. Boom. Uh, unmistakable. Uh, not some little point of light off in the distance, as skeptics wanted to say, but a glowing metallic disc right there. I got out, went towards it, thinking it would take off before I got anywhere near it. But um, uh, at one point, uh, the... Um, noise got louder and it started to move 
I jumped for cover, and uh, the rest of the crew were screaming at me to get back in the truck, so I uh, didn't need to be told. I uh, stood up to run back to the truck, and blam, I was I was hit by a, a powerful blast of energy. I, I just felt this numbing shock go through my body and lost consciousness. But the crew said it through me through the air 15 or 20 feet so violently they were certain it had killed me. And uh, they took off in a panic. Probably um, the wisest thing to do at that point. But uh, um, um, unable to get any help nearby, they uh, opted to return and uh, discovered that my body was no longer well and it fell. And they uh, went into town, reported to the law enforcement, and, and although the uh, uh, sheriff and his men could uh, see that uh, they were, you know, very serious and terribly upset, they they immediately suspected that this was a wild story uh, to cover up for another reason for my disappearance uh, that they had actually murdered me and concocted a, an unlikely uh, cover story. Um, Sheriff um, put together a massive search, went on for five days, and uh, at the end of which uh, the men, you know, were tired of the accusations. They volunteered. They brought it up on their own. Give us, give us any kind of test you want. So Sheriff brought in the state police lie detector expert and tested them and Eventually, the upshot of that was that uh, everyone passed. And as a matter of fact, everyone's passed. Uh, you know, uh, well, I wouldn't say everyone, but uh, multiple tests. Why? Well, you know, at the time, the uh, president of the American Polygraph Association said that um, no one test is 100. percent But if you've got six people passing uh, a test on the same issue. The odds would be a million to one if there had been any kind of an error in the testing. But that was with six tests. Now there have been 16, well, I don't know how many now, <laughs> uh, 20 maybe. Um, I heard from Steve, youngest guy on the crew recently, that every time he gets a new girlfriend, he winds up taking another test to try to convince him that, Yes, this really did happen, but uh, it, it's been a long battle for all of us, you know, um, contending with the public and in some cases, like with Steve, you know, his own family. And so, you know, when when all of this first broke, I mean, the National Enquirer had a big role in this. Can you tell us about about the National Enquirer and what they did or didn't do to help this? Well, you know, at the time they, you know, wanted to, it was a sensational story. They, you know, tabloids love sensational stories, but uh, uh, the the details were distorted, as is typical. Um, but uh, years later, uh, w- uh, one of the uh, reporters on the story uh, decided to try to cash in and recycle one of his old stories, and made up a bunch of. Uh, uh, scandalous claims that were just totally absurd and not verified by anyone. As a matter of fact, uh, contradicted by him because he ran the story more than once and and changed it, (laughs) you know, to contradict himself in uh, a couple of the versions that he put out there. But that's all I got to say about tabloids. But, uh, you know, there was kind of a segment of the media this sort of tabloid oriented and uh, that's a perfect opportunity for these uh, self-styled uh, debunkers they they were at the time people who just thought of themselves as knowing better than the public and it was their job to go out and uh, scream bogus about everything they didn't believe in so um had quite a campaign uh launched against us from uh, various skeptics, uh, the worst of which would have been 
a guy named Philip Class, and uh, boy, was that guy terrible. Very nasty stuff, just any, you know, dirt he could dig up on anybody. That was what he, you know, a character assassination it was uh, one of his uh, stocks in trade. But a variety of accusations that were ultimately disproved. So when, so how quickly after you had your experience did Phil Class enter the scene? Um, strangely enough, he he, he was uh, approaching uh, uh, the crew boss and the rest of the guys and never once attempted to contact me directly in any way. And um, I was always curious, now why that? Uh, but he certainly had plenty of negative to say about me, but, you know, he could have picked up the phone and called me or written me a letter, but he never did. Not that I <laughs> am disappointed at all. It was pretty nasty stuff. But years later, uh, there was a, a researcher who had uh, um, a, applied to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, the FBI file on this guy. And he had actually been under investigation by the FBI uh, on suspicion that he had been selling classified information to our enemies. You know, they were looking to see if he had uh, purchased any uh, radio transmitting equipment, things of that nature. And uh, ultimately, the the case was never resolved in his favor. It was uh, held in a kind of a what they call RUC status, which uh, it means they can hold it over his head and um, use it uh, to influence his behavior. And uh, the case was turned over to the Central Intelligence AG, Agency um, uh, with that in mind. And so that that is um, where I think uh, the um, $10,000 came from when he went and offered this as a bribe to uh, one of the guys on the crew. $10,000 bri uh, bribe to say it didn't happen or claim it was a hoax or something of that nature. And uh, it, it was documented that, you know, he actually made the bribe because uh, the uh, message was, was carried by a uh, local deputy, James Click, uh, because, you know, Steve didn't have a telephone where he could be reached directly. <laughs> there weren't uh, cell phones in those days. But um, uh, he, uh, uh, Phil Class, actually uh, took a quotation uh, of something that Mike Rogers had said. What he said was he had heard that Steve was considering taking the bribe. Of course, it was never serious. He... Uh, he told his wife, well, well, man, I'd like to get that $10,000. She says, well, you say it really happened in the end. And she goes, yeah, uh, uh, I just would like to get the money. And she said, no, you, you ain't you know, going to perjure yourself for, for $10,000. But so Mike said, well, if, if he does take a bribe, even though you know it really happened and would say so just for the money, then you'll be bruised. Well, Class uh, took that quotation and took the middle out of the sentence and su substituted three dots, even though you know it really happened and would say so just for the money. Uh, you know, that's about as deceitful and deceptive as you can be. He tried to make it look like Mike was threatening Steve to keep him from confessing the truth rather than you know, threatening him to uh, keep him from lying about it. But it was just example after example where he would distort the evidence, uh, change things, uh, alter quotations, uh, um, make claims that were just flat out disproved. And so when you are already dealing with the trauma of what you've been through and, you know, you're the people that were there with you, I mean, this is this this wasn't something that you were expecting. This is so out of the norm. And then you have somebody like Phil Class who is coming in and and affecting your life, basically intimidating you. I mean, how how did that affect you? And did 
was there a point in time when any of you got together to try to figure out how to counteract what Klaus was trying well, to at do? At one point, we, we, you know, he was criticizing the polygraph test, claiming this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and so we challenged him, you know, uh, said, you, uh, we'll, we'll take new tests, you know, to, uh, to, by, from an examiner you, ch- uh, you approve. And if we pass, you have to pay for it. If we fail, as you or you're saying we would, then we pay for it. Well, he he just quibbled and quarreled and and just you know ducked the, the challenge basically. Never never took us up on that at all. And in in many cases, their uh, um, tests were repeated. Um, I personally have passed five lie detector tests from three different. Uh, examiners, all of, all of whom were experienced police interrogators, uh, top-notch examiners, and uh, yeah, Dr. Harder made the point that if you had six people testifying that they had witnessed a murder, in the absence of a lie detector, that would be considered an open and shut case in a death penalty uh, trial. But here you have a situation where people. T- are passing uh, tests in addition to testifying to the police that this happened, and people just can't get enough of picking and picking and picking at things. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it got kind of tiresome after a while, the, the uh, absurdity of it sometimes. And so was he, did, did he have other people working for him? Um. I, it's very um, uh, suspicious that he, uh, wh- wh- who was who was uh, going to supply this ten thousand uh, uh, dollars? You know, it's our, it's our suspicion that it was the CIA. See, the the the, the memo in the FOIA uh, file out of his uh, FBI file um, was from J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI at that time, to someone in the memo described as director, Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, the CIA at that time was such a secret agency that they it wouldn't even mention the director's name in an internal memo. Now you'll you know nowadays you'll see the CIA director on television, you know, barking his opinion on political matters. But back in those days it was so secret they almost didn't admit there was such a thing, you know. Um, but it was, uh, suspected that, um, by, by a, a number of people that, uh, the CIA at that time was interested in suppressing acceptance of, uh, UFO incidents. Um, I think the government has, you know, gone through a transformation in that regard over time. But that, uh, you know, suppression was was the reaction that people were getting way back. Um, some people suspect that our government was gathering technology from um, UFO crashes and, and various incidents that gave them the upper hand against our enemies. And so it was so secretive at that time. Um, so... Um, nowadays it's, uh, it's, what do they say, uh, what's that expression about, uh, um, an open secret or something, you know, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the stuff that everybody knows that they're talking about and then saying it's all secret or whatever. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of jokes about that. And so, I mean, when, so I mean, obviously, there is this suspicion that you have with with other people that the CIA is involved and they're trying to suppress information. Were there people? No, that's, that's how it used to be. I think I think uh, uh, there's a lot of unwarranted suspicion of our government in regard to the UFO matters. People say, "Boy, I, I would just love them to just throw open the files and just you know tell us what they know. Why don't they tell us what they know?" You know, they they could not have any noble motive for that. You know, this is this is you know got to be some kind of treachery on their part. And I, I disagree. Um, you know, 
we 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 have enemies, and uh, you know whatever they make public to the American public is going to be shared with the world, and uh, it's not in our interest to let our enemies know uh, what we have or or what we don't have. Uh, it's probably a, a good idea to to keep them guessing, and so uh, I'm sure that the um, uh, government knows more than the general public knows, but at the same time. I I don't think they know everything, but uh, like I said, it's it's probably best to keep uh, keep the enemy guessing. Well, and, and and I absolutely agree with you. I mean, there there are national security <laughs> implications here, and I think sometimes that's why UFO organizations are are monitored so closely because. People uh, make statements that they're going to storm Area 51 or do things that are really stupid, and yeah, and that that does stupid. put us yeah I mean and it, it's it's that that puts all of us in jeopardy and we have a responsibility as American citizens to make sure that the people who are our law enforcement or or you know in in intelligence are supported because a majority of those people are doing good things so yeah, absolutely you know, agree with you. That- thinks that our government is in cahoots with aliens to take over the planet or anything like that. That's just absurd. Uh, you know, these people live here, they have children, and, you know, it's it's just ridiculous that uh, anybody would think that possible. To, to what end? You know, uh, I think that if uh, an alien technology wanted to take over this planet, it'd already be theirs and we'd never know what hit us, you know, boom, you know. Uh, it wouldn't be something uh, creeping along, uh, taking hundreds of years. And, you know, this is we're talking about technology vastly ahead of our own. Absolutely, and I love that, and I think that's really important for people to hear. Thank you, thank you so much. We're going to go to break. I am Erica Luke's here with Travis Walton. Stick around, ask questions in chat. We will be right back. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. One million miles till midnight. A story of timelines, artificial worlds, simulated races, and the galactic imprint. And the destiny of a blue world called Earth. One million miles till midnight. Written by Solaris Blue Raven. Is a journey through the mind's eye, which allows the reader to surf a wave of technological and multidimensional intellect. Revealing a bridge between conscious design and the truth. A multidimensional bleed-through awakens the world of artificial intelligence to set sail into the frontiers of a vast multiverse, morphing planets and terraforming ascended worlds beyond the linear programs of a fated race. One million miles till midnight will awaken, inspire, Prepare and enlighten one to the many multidimensional states of consciousness and worlds we reside in. With every cell and atom, we are this truth and multiverse. One Million Miles Till Midnight. Written by Solaris Blue Raven. Available now at Amazon.com. Don't wait. Get your copy today. If ever a breed was affectionate to a fault, it's the Golden Retriever. They're people dogs, pure and simple. And the Golden Retriever Rescue of Southern Nevada needs your help. If you would like to volunteer, foster, adopt, or donate, go to the Golden Retriever Rescue of Southern Nevada's website at grrsn.org. That's grrsn.org. Or call 598-GOLD. That's 598-G-O-L-D. Hi, this is Tim Swartz with Exploring the Bazaar, and I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. May the glorious message of peace and love fill you with joy during this wonderful season. Gee, it's so quiet. 
quiet, too quiet, terribly quiet, awfully quiet. <laughs> Do you have an hour to kill? Well, crank up those EVPs, spirit boxes, and walk the haunted halls of the unknown with UK's very own paranormal investigator, David Cook. You guys ready for this? The Ghostly Hour, live Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. And now, your mind. Come hear first-hand accounts of some of the most famous ghost sightings, photos, and videos from around the world. Skeptics, believers, and spirits, both good and bad. Welcome, welcome to the Ghostly Hour, hosted by David Cook. Live every Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. <laughs> You're, listening. You are listening to You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name, KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at kcorradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. Next week, I will have Richard Thiem on. And if you need to go uh, learn, what, which I would suggest, I would go to themeworks.com. He is very proficient in the world of hacking. He worked in intelligence and also helped author one of the best UFO books uh, in the subject. So I would definitely check up on him. This will be great to have him on. He does. Yeah, I don't think he's done a, a, an interview on a UFO show for a long, long time. This will be very cool. My guest this evening is Travis Walton. I can't believe he's never been on my show, but I feel every time I see him at a conference that there is just this connection and that his he is so sincere and I can't imagine what he's been through. And I Travis, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. And then also you can go to TravisWalton.com to learn more uh, about about the documentary and all of these things. And I want to say a little bit about Fire in the Sky because there were some, some things that you felt weren't necessarily accurate in that. Will you talk about that just for a moment? Well, sure. You know, it's, it's typical that when Hollywood... Uh uh, dramatizes a story. They they can't resist uh, fictionalizing and uh, spicing up things that don't need spicing up. Uh, so um, there's a, a number of things uh, that where they just uh, got carried away. And the worst of it was uh, what happened aboard the craft. Um, about the time the movie was about to come out, there was a, a television series uh, that depicted similar creatures. And the head of the studio was terrified that, you know, that, that would destroy the value of the movie, that all people were really interested in was seeing a different creature, <laughs> which is not at all the case. And, you know, uh, they look how they look. And, and, and you know, different people in different uh, uh, incidents, widely separated, uh, were s describing the same beings. But... Uh, so, whatever happened aboard the craft, it can pretty much disregard. There's only, uh, in the movie, uh, one scene there that uh, I thought, uh, although it was a fictionalization, probably did a better job of explaining something. Uh, there's a scene where the actor's face is covered with a membrane, and he's struggling to scream through it, struggling to breathe through it. And there was never any membrane over my face, but... Uh, if you showed the actor just breathing hard and looking panicked, you wouldn't understand what the feeling of suffocation can do to generate uh, fear, you know. And, you know, it's been compared to waterboarding. It's just, it's something that even though the, 
the person that's having this done to them knows that they're not going to die. And it, it's still extremely effective because there's no fear like uh, the fear that suffocation brings about. So um, that was one thing. But uh, um, other other things that they changed in the movie are, are minor and not really having a whole lot of bearing. Um, in real life, there were seven of us out there. It was a seven-man crew. Uh, but they reduced it to five for the movie, um, which, of course, is not an embellishment. It's... You know, I guess it's better to have more witnesses than fewer, but uh, I, I guess they wanted to introduce fewer characters and make it easier for the, you know, the audience to keep track of what's going on. I don't know, pay fewer actors, whatever the deal is. <laughs> right. But I am interested in, in uh, a remake, and I've been in discussion with a number of producers about it. Uh, with the idea of sticking to the story, you know, uh, being more accurate, because that's what people want, and uh, and 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 the, this has kind of sort of evolved into uh, rather than a feature film, as I thought about for so many years, uh, to actually turn it into a mini series, because that would be an opportunity to uh, pack a lot more information in there that that wasn't really available at the time. Things about the effects of radiation, of magnetic readings, uh, you know, uh, theories about um, what you know what the aliens' uh, motive was, and a whole lot of uh, information that came out over time that just wasn't available uh, at the time that Fire in the Sky was made. But I'm still grateful that uh, that movie was made in that it woke a lot of people up to uh, the existence of this incident and uh, and and had them sort of vicariously experience this incredible emotional ringer that we went through at that time. And, and I mean, I will never forget watching that movie. I it, it was very emotional. And I think more than that, I will never forget just hearing you speak uh, at, at different lectures or seeing the emotion in your face. And so, you know, I, I had asked you on the break if you were still in Snowflake, and you are, and that to have to have your community surrounding you and and, all, and everybody in your town went through this, not to the to the extent that you have, obviously, but I mean, tell us what that has been like for you over, over the decades to have your community involved in this, and what effects did that have on them? Well, you know, at the time, people were eager to explain it away. It was scary, and anything you could do to, to you know, discredit it, you know, help them uh, um, um, sort of reduce their fears, and but it was it was ridiculous how uh, stories that people dug up, you know, they some very often weren't even accurate. <laughs> you know, some really unkind things. You know, a neighbor saying, "Well, if they're looking for a, a perfect specimen, they'll bring Travis back." Well, <laughs> that's totally uncalled for, and uh, I wouldn't say I'm a perfect specimen, but there was. There was uh, you know, at, the, at that time, I would go out and people who I knew uh, would look away and uh, pretend they didn't see me, you know. And uh, it's it's really changed. And, I, you know, I tell people nowadays I go out and people I don't really know pretend that we're good friends. <laughs> and that we had all this extensive relationship. So... You know, it's it's you know, it's much more positive. You know that you know my friends and neighbors, friends and quotes. You know. So who? I mean, when when this happened, and and people were turning away, and and all of this. I mean, who were the people in that community that really stuck up for you, or that? that started to understand the gravity of your situation? Well, I had...
had good friends. The people who knew me best and my family were the ones who, you know, uh, expressed, well, everything I know about him, you know, this must be true, you know. And um, so the people who knew the least about me pretended, uh, pretended to know the most, uh, did the most talking. Um, but, you know, I have to um, sort of, a lot of people condemn um, the sheriff, you know, for uh, being suspicious of the murder and investigated from that standpoint. And he really did, you know, have a public uh, position that he took as, you know, being disbelieving. But I, uh, I didn't really, uh, you know, um, believe him about that because... You know, he had confided uh, to, you know, the crew and uh, some of my family that he himself had experienced uh, some sightings. And, you know, over the years, I've I've come to find out that the police officers are very often uh, more likely to have a sighting of because there are people who are out on patrol at night and they're, you know, trained observers and they're, you know, their job is to be looking around, checking things out. So, I, uh, you know, every time I've been pulled over for a daylight out or anything like that, uh, I've gotten a lot more positive comments from law enforcement. And uh, over the years, uh, uh, Sheriff Gillespie's uh, friends and family confided to me that privately he was much more believing. And it wasn't until the Travis film that he finally said so on camera. And that that, that has to be for somebody in law enforcement. I mean, that's got to be a really tough bridge to cross, well, especially you know, in a I small think, town. I think so. all the lawmen involved were sort of proud to be played by a, a, a Western icon like James Garner. Good you know, point. Good James point. Garner's uh, in a movie playing the part of a big skeptic, you know, derisively, you know, accusing the crew. But um, ironically, uh, James Garner pulled me aside when we were on the set and, and said, you know, I regret playing the part of the skeptic here because I, I believe you guys are telling the truth. So um, maybe that added to the sheriff's. Uh, um, final admission that he wasn't as skeptical as he, he uh, had held forth over the years. He was an elected official, and he felt to um, to uh, play to the prejudices that he that he thought existed. Um, would help him get elected, but you know, ultimately, I think uh, uh, everybody was a lot more believing than they wanted to let on. They wanted to admit. So, did, during this time, did you have anybody that surprised you in the community that reached out to you to say that they they believed your story? Well, I would say um, I had always. Um, been uh, very respectful of uh, Sheriff Gillespie uh, for being somebody uh, as a man of uh, integrity. Uh, you know, it might take a, a minute to tell this story, but, you know, I got a ticket, a um, traffic ticket. I don't remember whether it was loud pipes or speeding or something, but I showed up at the appointed time for my court date and... Uh, Door was locked and the judge wasn't there. So I sat on the doorstep for a quarter of an hour. He never came. So I just went home. Well, the next day I'm walking down the street and he arrests me. The the, the sheriff does. I'm mean, not the, the town marshal does. Throws me in the jail, locks me up. I'm a, uh, I'm a minor. You know, this was when I was in high school. This was before the incident happened. Doesn't even report uh, the arrest to my mother. And, you know, you don't lock minors in jail by themselves and not tell their parents. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a 
tragedy that happened a few years before in Payson where they had arrested some uh, group of rowdy high school kids on graduation night and uh, locked them up and the gas heater had leaked and killed them all. Oh, wow. And so, you know, that was not... I was pretty upset being uh, treated this way. And there was no place to sit down in the cell. The bed was soaking wet. The sink was torn off the wall. So I broke out of this Cracker Jack jail. <clears throat> and I went down and turned myself in to Sheriff Gillespie. Well, the local deputy, one of his deputies, the, 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 the Snowflake uh, officer, come down to pick me up and walks in there and says, yeah. God, it's a real rough one here. He tore up our jail, tore the sink off the wall. And Gillespie stands up, points his finger at his deputy and says, he gives the guy's name, I don't want to say it on air. Don't you lie to me. I was down there last week and that sink was torn off the wall then. He got real red in the face, but there, there was Sheriff Gillespie standing up to his own deputy because he knew the guy was lying to him trying to frame me for vandalizing something I didn't do. Well, they they dropped the charges and that was the end of the story. But, you know, it was just remarkable to me that Sheriff Gillespie stood up for the truth in, in, in spite of uh, it being his own deputy. And so is how when did he pass away? Uh, just last year. And is did, what were your last interactions with him before he passed away? Well, we did an interview together on the Travis video that's uh, being offered on at my website. I would never name a a, a book or a, a a movie Travis, but that's what the filmmaker named it. Travis, the true story of uh, Travis Walton, and. Uh, he, that's where he came on camera and said, well, I, I, guess they, I guess they were trying to tell the truth. And he acknowledged that uh, um, they had been investigating some cattle mutilations in the area at the time. And, uh, you know... Um, that And that's got to be... That has to make you, I mean, be, 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 like I've said, all of you went through your own own experiences with this. None as profound uh, as what you dealt with. But, I mean, just to see the way this whole community reacted, and some more gracefully than others. But I am glad that it, you are still there and that you found uh, the, the sense of acceptance and that people are finally understanding the gravity of what you went through and your bravery for, for coming out with all of this. Well, it is gratifying to, you know, to have, to be treated better, uh, you know, than, than in the past, you know, it's been sort of a project of mine, uh, consider it my my mission these days is to try to set the record straight and and just you know get some basic understanding out there that we're not alone in the universe period you know and uh that that shouldn't be alarming that shouldn't be something to, to fear and i think that's one of the biggest obstacles that people have to accepting the fact that you know, these billions of stars you see in the sky out there are not devoid of life. I think it's awesomely arrogant for people to think that this little speck of dust here is the only um, source of life in the universe. It's uh, much, much bigger than that. And uh, just nothing to, nothing to fear, you know. And virtually everything technological that humans have is only a few hundred years old. And uh, Michio Kaku was on, well, I think it was Larry King, he was saying, no, people keep um, uh, envisioning these um, 
other civilizations as being maybe a few hundred years ahead of us. But, you know, based on the age of these star systems, they could literally be thousands or millions of years ahead of us. You know, even even our uh, current today's technology, show it to somebody a few hundred years ago and they would consider it magic. So obviously, you know, the comparison being that, you know, give a civilization a few million years and, uh, you know, don't be uh, so presumptuous as to place limitations on what you think is, quote, possible and not possible. And, and I love that because I, I have had experiences myself and I, I am try, I'm striving to find answers to that. And I'm also, I feel like you do where we have this community and there's so many conspiracy theories that are prevalent and that isn't serving the greater good of this, this issue. And so briefly just talk about the conspiracy theories and some of the concerns that you have. Yeah, I, I think it would be absurd that, um, uh, you know, to presume that our uh, government would conspire with uh, an alien civilization to uh, uh, help them take over the earth or, uh, you know, it's it just doesn't ring true in any uh, as sensible way. There's good common sense national security reasons that our government's going to be interested in it and secretive about it, but certainly nothing that would justify um them using alien technology against us to enslave us or anything of that nature. Uh, if they wanted to do that, they're capable of doing that on, all on their own, just like uh, the dictatorships around the, the world uh, do. But uh, uh, the United States is is different, you know. We have a, a constitution and, uh, and a bill of rights, and, you know, it's a first in which the rights of the people are uh, enshrined in the the basic documents, the fundamental principles of the of the uh, entire society. And so, do you? Do you, why do you feel that the UFO community has been so manipulated? Is this just people that are? looking for, for fame, or is there an ulterior motive, or what do you chalk that up to? Well, I think people are misled, you know, and, and by their own fears. They fear that this could be, and you know, very often people, you know, try to make it real, what, what they what their fear is, is the case. And there's plenty of people who will disagree with me and say, oh, no, you know, they are evil aliens, but, you know, i I'm always, uh, you know, not always. <laughs> Actually, I, I I I used to think like that myself. But over time, it became apparent to me that if these beings had this vast power, this incredible technology, that if they hadn't outgrown our uh, human tendencies to be tribal and warlike and uh, that sort of thing, that they would have destroyed themselves long ago. I mean, it's bad enough that we have nuclear weapons and we could potentially destroy ourselves here on this earth, but you imagine a technology with far greater power, the ability to destroy entire planets, entire solar systems, uh, uh, you know, in the blink of an eye. Uh, if they hadn't gotten past the, the, the petty warlike uh stage we're in, they would have ceased to exist. The mere fact that they're still alive suggests to me that their moral and ethical development has kept pace with the technology of necessity. The ones who didn't, did destroy themselves. That's not to say that every life form out there on these other planets is all super advanced of us. There's probably, you know, cave people running around out there somewhere too, but... <laughs> Those aren't the ones that are coming here. Oh, I love it. I love it. And I knew this was going to be a great interview. Thank you so much. And so where can people, I mean, I know that you're not speaking for a little bit, but where can, if, when your next speaking engagement, where will that be? Oh, boy. I don't know which one the next one would be. I'll, 
Contact in the Desert is coming up. I'll, I'll probably be at AlienCon again. Oh, and the International UFO Congress that's happening in Scottsdale next year is uh, is a really big one. But uh, there's a number. Just just check uh, with my uh, website, and I'll, I'll I'll get my schedule updated there. And um, there's a, a bunch of them coming up next year. Great. And in Fire in the Sky, The Walton Experience. I mean, this is a great book and I've got a, a listener who does a great deal for me and I need to talk to you about getting a signed copy for for his son, which would be really, really cool. But uh, I mean, Travis, thank you so much. I appreciate your candid thoughts and I appreciate just, your, just learning from you and seeing you. You've always been so kind to me. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me. And anybody that wants more information, go go to my website, TravisWalton.com, and uh, go from there. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. Be safe, and and I will look forward to seeing you at the next conference. And I'm Erica Lukes here. Thank you for tuning in to UFO Classified. Make sure you share information about the show, and also chat me up on Facebook get the information out. I really care about making sure that we have correct information and we're not propagating myths. So stick around for Great Night in KCOR. I will catch you next week. Listen very carefully. This is Houston, say again, please. This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait.